Welcome. Welcome to the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. Turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 23, and follow along as I read here. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he did, was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from, don't know where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Please bear with me. I intend to show why we are beginning our series of, in this, of this majestic Sermon on the Mount here in this passage of John's Gospel. Let's examine what we've read here. And notice that I started in the last three verses of chapter 2. Remember this, that before the King James Bible, there were no chapters, there were no verses. It was all just one letter, this Gospel that John wrote. And it's like these three verses in chapter 2 serve for John as a preamble to this great encounter between the Lord Jesus Christ and Nicodemus. The scene is the Passover in Jerusalem. Many people, it says, believed in his name. Now in the modern church, that would automatically make them eligible for membership. They would automatically be believers as far as many, many people in many, many pulpits would say. But it says Jesus didn't believe in them. They believed in him. He did not believe in them. And so we come to this encounter after the fact that Jesus rejected people who said they believed in him. And here is Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a Pharisee. He saw Jesus as a teacher. He did not see Jesus for whom he was. He didn't see Jesus as somebody who came, he saw Jesus as someone who came from God. And he wanted to know how Jesus did the things that he did as a teacher. And the Lord stops him. He just cuts him off. And Jesus says to him, in effect, he says to him, the things you want to know, you aren't allowed to know. You can't know. Why? Because Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must be born again. 
See, Nicodemus wanted spiritual information. And that's reserved only for Christians. There's two kinds of people in the world. There are the people who are born of water, and then there are the people who are born of water and of the Spirit. And Jesus is saying to, to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. In fact, Nicodemus, to even see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. So it's here that Jesus begins to explain the difference to Nicodemus. Those who are merely born of water, physical birth, cannot receive these things. These things were totally foreign to Nicodemus as Jesus explained them. What Jesus is saying is the new birth is something that the Holy Spirit himself must do. We can't do it. Listen to again what he says. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it. But you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What he's saying in effect is the Holy Spirit is the midwife to everyone who is born again. You know, we desperately need to get rid of the idea that all it takes for someone to become a Christian is that they walk down an aisle, they make a mental assent or decision about the Lord Jesus Christ, and that settles our eternal spiritual future forever. Those three verses in chapter 2 ought to quiet that. But in fact, listen to how the Lord Jesus Christ ends the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone, Jesus says, who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now I ask you, have you ever heard anything more chilling than that? I don't think there's anything in Scripture more chilling than that. These were people who called him Lord. They were standing in a line believing that he was going to smile on them and welcome them into eternity. They actually preached in his name, it says. They actually cast out demons in his name. They performed miracles in his name. And notice, Jesus never said that they didn't do these things. They did these things. He just said that he never knew them. We talk all the time about knowing the Lord, knowing God, knowing Jesus. Jesus constantly talks about him knowing us. Well, what does it mean when it says he never knew them? Well, the word to know, word know is a relational word. It's the same word that's used in John 17, 3 in his high priestly prayer. He said, this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. The emphasis here is on God knowing us, on the Lord Jesus Christ knowing us. The, well, the purpose for this whole discussion so far is that we might become acutely aware that it's humanly possible to be deceived about our profession of faith. In 1 John, John says this, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. How many in the modern church have been led to believe that all they have to do is say they believe and they are Christians? They sit in church the rest of their life. Nothing is ever different about their life. Nothing's going on in their life. But they've been saved somehow because they made a decision. How contrary. How contrary to scripture this scenario is. How deceptive. It's as easy today to become a Republican, to become a Republican as it is to become a Christian. 
All you have to do is say you are. But listen to Paul when he's talking to the church of, of Corinth. Now, these are church people he's talking to. Test yourself, he says, to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. Or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? That's the church people. Or listen to that often misunderstood passage in Hebrews 6. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good words of God and the power of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since, again, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Let's look at those people for a second. Who are they? They're people who have been enlightened, who have tasted, who have been made partakers, and then they fall away. Who are these people? Where, where are they in a position to hear and to partake and to, and to be enlightened? There's only one place. They're people who sat in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and heard all of this and partook of the word and were enlightened by the word but they were never born as Jesus talks about in John 3 they were never born of the spirit or listen to the Lord himself as he taught a parable a parable in all of the gospels about the sower and how he sowed seed in different on, on different landscapes. Really, it's a, it's really a parable about the soil, not about the sower. And one of those landscapes says this: those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. Again, in the modern church, they would be welcomed in. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. Here's the Lord, here the Lord is teaching that it's possible for a person to hear the word, accept it with joy, believe it for a while, and then fall away. Or again in Hebrews, take care, brethren, that there, not, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Okay. So what does all of this have to do with the Sermon on the Mount? Well, the Bible clearly warns us that we have an enemy. He's Satan. His strongest weapon is deception. Adam and Eve were perfect people in a perfect environment and Satan made them fall. He can disguise himself as an angel of light. His disciples, demons, teach many false doctrines. Listen to Paul and talking to Timothy, but the Spirit explicitly says that in the later times, some, will, some in the church will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. He delights in preaching false religion to people, leading them to believe they know Christ when they don't. So what does it mean to be born again? What does it look like? Nicodemus didn't have a clue, and he was a, he was a leader of Israel. The answer is the Sermon on the Mount. In particular, it's the Beatitudes. The Sermon on the Mount defines what it means to be born again. You know how often we're, we're guilty of using biblical terms that we really haven't defined, we really don't understand what they mean. Well, the Beatitudes will take us step by step through an analysis 
of what it means to be born again. This is the guts, if I can so speak it in this is kind of a way. This is the guts of the new birth. These beatitudes are. And we'll see clearly, very clearly, that the new birth is something that must be done by the Holy Spirit himself. Again, as the Lord says in John 3, to be born of the Spirit. I keep emphasizing that because so often we're led to believe, even from pulpits, that we somehow can birth ourselves. Nobody ever has physically and nobody ever will spiritually. The Beatitudes are a perfect guide to show us the work of the Spirit in us. First of all, in these Beatitudes, all Christians are meant to be and will be like this. These, these Beatitudes, there are eight of them, they will be true of every Christian. There is no such thing as a Christian who does not have these Beatitudes working in them. Now, they may work to different, different degrees. The emphasis may be different in one person than the other, but all the Beatitudes will be there. All Christians will manifest all of these characteristics. Different intensity, maybe, but not in kind. Each Beatitude leads naturally into each other. We're going to begin with poor in spirit. And to be poor in spirit is to be broken. And only the Holy Spirit can do this. The person who's broken will grieve and mourn over their condition. And they will become humble. They'll become meek. And they will begin to hunger and thirst to know God. All of these Beatitudes lead into each other. All are wholly a disposition that is produced by grace alone. You know, no person can naturally conform to these Beatitudes. It can't be. It doesn't matter what your temperament is or my temperament. People of various degrees of temperament. There are people who, who are just quite naturally angry people. It applies to them. There are people who are very docile. It applies to them. Because it's the work of the Holy Spirit in us changing us and bringing us into conformity with Christ. Well, how does this help us? Well, this is probably, perhaps, the best test of our profession of our faith. Remember that, those verses that I read from the end of Matthew 7. Many, Jesus says, and he knows, Many are going to come to me, and they're going to call me Lord, Lord, and they're going to have done some incredible things, but I won't have known them. That's something that I don't think we should ever get over, that we can be deceived and fooled as Adam and Eve were. We must take our faith out, our profession of faith out, and examine it. Two things are going to happen. One of two things are going to happen for you when you do this. One, as you go through, we go through these Beatitudes in detail, you'll say, yes, that is true. That happened to me then. It's happening to me now. Because you see with these Beatitudes, yes, they do happen to the new believer. But they continue to happen in a person who's been a Christian 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. God is constantly breaking us down. He's constantly working in us. He's constantly bringing us, uh, humbling us. He's constantly bringing us to the place where we, we renew our hunger and thirst after him. That never ends. That is an ongoing thing. Because you see, God is interested in, in cleaning out all of the dross out of us, making us ready to live with him forever. 
Or on the other hand, as we look at these Beatitudes, you may say, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but I can't honestly say that's true of me. You know, that was the case of, that was my case. For years, I heard people say, talk about repentance and life change and how you're a new creation and a new creature. And I, and I would rush right past it because in my heart of hearts, I knew I was still the same person that I'd always been. I wasn't a new creature. Until God finally broke me down and showed me, I don't know you. And I got on my knees and pleaded with him. And that's when he awakened me. That's when the spirit began his work in me. And I came up with a phrase, I'm not who I was. And I didn't do it. Because up until that time, I knew that everything, every change that had come about in me, I had manufactured, I had done. But I can look at my life now and say, I'm not who I was and I didn't do it. The Holy Spirit did. Well, finally, why should we study the Sermon on the Mount at all? Well, I'm gonna give you seven reasons. The first one is, this is a perfect picture of the life of a Christian in God's kingdom. Perfect picture. It's what it looks like, it's what it should look like to be a Christian. The second reason is the Lord Jesus Christ died to enable us to live this sermon. You're not gonna live it if you're not born again. But he died that we might be born again, that we might be able to live this sermon. He covers a lot of ground in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And he put it there because we can live it in Christ. Number three, nothing shows me the absolute need of the new birth and the Holy Spirit and his work within so much as the Sermon on the Mount. Number four, when we come to truly understand these Beatitudes, They'll crush us. They'll crush us to the ground. And then they'll lift our souls to heaven. But remember this. The gospel is always negative before it's positive. Any talk of just a positive gospel is a false teaching. It's always negative first. Remember that story of Simeon in the temple when they brought the baby Jesus in and he took the child in his arms and he said, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel. It's got to be negative first. These first three Beatitudes are very negative. They're negative. They're looking at ourself. The great goal of every human being um, next point is the great goal of every human being is the quest for happiness. Well, the Sermon on the Mount is God's singular answer to mankind's happiness. God tells us how to obtain this happiness. We will find the more we try to live and practice the Sermon on the more, Mount, the more we shall experience real and complete blessings and happiness. And then the last point is, the Sermon on the Mount is the very best means of evangelism. You know, most churches keep their focus on outreach. How do we attract people to us? The world today desperately needs to see true Christians. It desperately needs to see true Christians. The church does not need to organize evangelistic campaigns to attract outside people. It needs to begin to live the Christian life in front of the world. Mahatma Gandhi 
once said, Christianity would be the most irresistible religion in the world if it were not for the Christian. You know, Gandhi studied law in England. He practiced law in South Africa before becoming the leader of the second most populate, populated country in the world. His assessment, he found the so-called Christians to be frauds with a phony faith. What if he had encountered people who by the power of the Holy Spirit were actually living the Sermon on the Mount? Would it have made a difference? Let me get more personal. What if he encountered, had encountered you or me? Would it have made a difference? One final word here. How are you receiving this introduction? Does it excite you to have the opportunity to examine your faith? Are you excited about an in-depth study of this great and glorious sermon? Or do you find a reluctance inside of yourself, a hesitation to go forward? This is the first test of your faith. Does God's word excite you? Let us all come to this study with the intent to let God show us ourselves, to let him show us our hearts so that we may be pleased to him and pleasing to him. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, we thank you this day that we can know you that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross to bring us to you, Father. For you are worthy of knowing. There is no one like you. You are glorious. You are sovereign. You are good and loving. And Father, we come to you in Christ as your children. And we ask you, Father, to open our hearts and our minds and our eyes and our ears that we might come to know ourselves, that we might not be deceived, Father, and if we are truly yours, may this time of study be a blessing, a time of renewal, Father, and then take us deeper than we've ever been into what it means to be a Christian and to live this Christian life. And we will give you the praise and the glory for it is in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we pray, amen.